Honorable Minister, uh, Your Excellencies, uh, distinguished experts, uh, guests, welcome. Uh, my name is Danny Berkeley. I am the Program Director at the Center for Public Impact, and I have the pleasure of facilitating this conversation today. The Center for Public Impact is a not-for-profit foundation established by BCG, the Boston Consulting Group, and we work with governments around the world on improving their impact. And we're all here today because we believe that artificial intelligence can have a positive impact in the public sector. And today I hope that we can have an open and frank conversation and discussion about, uh, to use uh, Prime Minister Rata's words, how we can improve people's lives and deliver better public services using artificial intelligence. Uh, I'd like to start by introducing the participants uh, of this roundtable, and then I'll briefly outline our intention uh, for the next hour or so. Uh, we have the pleasure of uh, being joined by uh, Ng Chi Kern, the Permanent Secretary of Smart Nation and Digital Government of Singapore. Uh, Dr. Uh, Krings, Parliamentary State Secretary in the Federal Ministry of the Interior, Building and Community of Germany. Minister uh, Breen, Minister of State for Trade, Employment, Business, uh, EU, DSM, and Data Protection of Ireland. Lord Ashton, the uh, Parliamentary Undersecretary of State in the United Kingdom. Uh, and uh, Mrs. Karjalainen, the DG for Public Sector ICT in the Ministry of Finance of Finland. And then finally, we have our distinguished group of experts, uh, Miguel. Uh, Carrasco, senior partner at the Boston Consulting Group. Uh, Ping Sun, the chief executive of GovTech in Singapore. Uh, Osa Setterberg, the chief digital officer of Sweden. Uh, Martin Kavets, the national digital advisor for Estonia. And uh, Dr. Vasiliev, the CEO of Tilde. I'd like to structure the coming hour in uh, four parts. At CPI, we've been doing extensive research on the use of artificial intelligence in government, and in all briefness, I'll share the key findings from that research. We'll then have presentations uh, from our experts, as well as from uh, DJ Karia Leinen, uh, which uh, will be between three and five minutes, and I'd kindly ask all experts to stick to three to five minutes, so we have enough time for a conversation afterwards. And after the expert presentations, we'll open it up uh, for a conversation uh, between uh, ourselves, and we'll then conclude with a brief summary. Uh, a little bit of housekeeping. Uh, this session is being live streamed. If uh, you speak, please push the uh, button on your microphone. When you're done speaking, this is important, please push the button again. That releases uh, the microphone and allows someone else uh, to speak. When we're in the conversation, uh, Minister Breen will open, uh, will uh, go first and will open the conversation. After that, if you'd like to speak, please indicate it to me uh, and I'll keep uh, a running tally. As I've already mentioned, we believe in the positive power uh, of government to change outcomes of citizens and uh, AI can play a huge role in that. And now is the right time, as we've heard this morning, with the amount of compute and data and tools available that were not available just a couple of years ago. But there's also a lot of hype in the conversation. And uh, Prime Minister Rata said that we need to demystify uh, this technology, and hopefully we can do some of that in the next hour. Uh, this is not magic, this is a tool, or in the words of uh, Greg Carrada from Google, uh, this is a set of pliers, possibly the most impressive pliers anyone has ever seen, uh, but still pliers. And we believe that uh, to make artificial intelligence in government work, the one thing that is absolutely foundational is trust and legitimacy. We have a report that we launched today on that very question, and we think that for AI government to be successful, we need to design and implement it in a legitimate way from the get-go. And in the report, we outline five specific actions uh, that we believe that lead to successful and legitimate public sector use of artificial intelligence. 
The first one is starting with the on-the-ground needs of the end users, which can be either civil servants or the citizens that we're serving. We need to build systems to address those needs rather than the needs of the organization or possibly of a vendor. Secondly, we should think of AI as doing tasks rather than replacing jobs. We heard this earlier today as well. We need to find the tasks, the specific tasks that AI can help with, rather than think about which jobs it might replace. Thirdly, we need to educate uh, the people inside our organizations as well as the general public to be empowered to understand what this technology is, what it isn't, what it can, what it can't do, and crucially, what it shouldn't do. And fourth, innovation is important, but we also need to think about maintenance. Uh, we need to think about how we maintain and improve the systems uh, once we've put them in place. And we can't just move on uh, to the next project without worrying about how we maintain and improve existing systems. And then finally, we ought to be building systems that are resolutely open towards the public, towards civil servants and possibly towards other governments. So we build them to embrace extended scrutiny and transparency. And if we do these things, uh, will build public trust in the public sector use of AI and will achieve the positive public impact that we can achieve using this technology. I'd now like to invite uh, the experts to each share their views with us. Uh, I'd like to ask Mrs. Karolainen to go first. Thank you. And uh, do I get the... Slide. Yep. 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 So um, I plan to tell you about our uh, way forward with artificial intelligence in the public sector. And um, first of all, we did in Finland. Uh, there was a, there is a group working on AI and and published a, a report uh, end of last year with key eight key actions where one is the, the number six is that we will build the world's best public services and that is the, the Aurora AI we are now focusing on. So what we are doing is, is uh, we are looking at uh, human-centric and, and productive uh, society where the, the p uh, person is in the center and uh, that we take, uh, make better conditions for a person to take care of him or herself in the different uh, live, live events. So um, what are we then uh, making is that uh, we are building a, a artificial intelligence network where information and service needs move between the uh, different smart applications. And um, it it's, uh, communicates uh, so that when the information is, is flowing uh, from uh, agencies, but also from uh, private sector. And uh, how we are building it up is that we have the, the ethical information resources, so the, the base registries where the information is existing at the moment. We are building the network above it, and, and the service needs are then according the uh, different live events uh, we are, uh, have been building up. And the experience is then for the citizens uh, um, to get the service um, from a mobile phone, using the mobile phone mainly. Um, there is uh, um, what we have um, done already is that we have in the Finnish Immigration Service a, a chatbot in place, which, uh, which is a virtual assistant. It speaks Finnish, but also bad English like mine. So multi-language, and, and it's uh, intended for persons coming to Finland so that uh, it can help uh, persons um, when they arrive. Um, we are also um, putting together different chatbots because that was the idea of the network. And uh, now we are building a possibility for a, a foreign persons coming uh, to Finland and, and uh, starting up companies. So we are connecting the um, uh, support from the taxation office, chatbot from taxation office, uh, to the um, uh, patent and registry office where you open up the, the new company. So this is on the, the way at the moment. 
Um, so uh, what we have done, everything is based and organized based on the life events. We have three life events in place. Uh, one is a person moving to another city to start to study. Second one is the engage your working life through lifelong learning. And the third one is the well-being of a family in the uh, different family situations. And what we have is the, the distributed uh, network, uh, which I, I uh, explained, but the second step would be a digital twin to help you to navigate in the, in the um, uh, AI world. And um, where we are going at the moment is that uh, we are doing these proof of concepts and uh, making at the same time also the plan for Im uh, further implementation and the, the plan to implement uh, further overall for the whole public sector would be then in, in coming uh, few years. As you might know, we are having a elections also in Finland next springtime, and this is one of our targets to get really fly after the elections. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, indeed, we'll go uh, in this order. Uh, so I'd like to ask Miguel Carrasco to go up next. Thank you, Danny, distinguished guests, and thank you to Estonia for hosting the summit. Um, I think the opportunity for AI-driven government uh, is substantial, and we're barely scratching the surface still. Um, I worked recently with a large federal government agency to develop a proof of concept, um, which was an AI recommendation engine that helped uh, use existing data and make personalised recommendations like Amazon does. Um, on what sorts of interventions are going to be most effective for a job seeker. And then we ran an optimization model on the top of that and showed that we could achieve outcomes earlier for the same expenditure and reduce job seeker time in unemployment. And this is just one example of the significant impact that AI could have. To help understand how people uh, feel about AI and citizens' attitudes, um, BCG conducted some research. Um, we asked about 14,000 citizens around the world in 30 different countries um, about their level of support for AI decision making in government. And I wanted to share with you uh, some of the key findings. Um, the first thing is that uh, citizens are generally supportive um, about government use of AI, but that level of support varies considerably uh, depending on the use case. So for example, there is quite strong support uh, for AI in things like traffic and transport optimization, uh, in predictive maintenance for things like buses and trains, um, and for customer service tools like AI chatbots. There is less strong support but still positive support for AI in things like tax and welfare and visa processing. Um, but there's clearly opposition to the use of AI making decisions in sensitive areas like justice, for example. Um, where the, the complexity and ambiguity most citizens feel should still require human judgment and discretion. What it shows is that it will be important for governments to build legitimacy for AI services across the different range of uh, things that government does. The second finding is that support for AI is moderately correlated with trust in government. We found citizens in China, India, the UAE and Indonesia who rank highly on the Edelman Trust Barometer tend to be most supportive of government use of AI. Perhaps surprisingly, the weakest support was in leading digital countries like Sweden, Denmark, and Estonia. We found that less developed economies and countries where there's a high reported or perceived levels of corruption tend to be supportive of AI. And this could be interpreted as a preference by citizens for machine decision making over human decision making where confidence in the machinery of government and transparency and, te and integrity um, in the public service may be lower. Finally, resolving the moral and ethical implications of AI usage are among the top concerns. However, I think the overall concern is probably less than we might expect. We found one third of citizens expressed concerns around significant moral or ethical issues which have not yet been resolved. One in four are concerned about the potential for bias and discrimination in decision making based on historical data. Other major concerns include the lack of transparency and questions around the accuracy of results and analysis. In closing, 
We believe governments need to do two things. One, to build trust and legitimacy and confidence in AI, and two, develop AI capabilities inside the public service. One quarter of citizens are concerned about the capability of the public service to use AI effectively, and governments need to focus their attention on building those capabilities so that we can maximise the benefits that AI might bring. Thank you very much. Uh, Miguel, ping on, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you, Danny. Good afternoon, gentlemen. Uh, thank you for the opportunity uh, to share Singapore's perspective on this topic. If I could just get the slide on. Right. I actually wanted to start uh, with this chart as courtesy of the Imperial Tech Foresight. I think they recently collated a list of 100 disruptive technologies that will change the world. And you can see from this chart that each technology is color-coded and uh, slotted into a space measuring the potential for disruption and how soon it will become a reality. So, for example, if you look at the green elements, uh, such as cryptocurrencies in the bottom left, uh, these are things that are happening now. Uh, the yellow blocks, such as the human organ printing, uh, could come to pass in the near future. And then the red elements, such as uh, better fuel robots, you know, it sounds like something coming straight out of Iron Man, uh, a more distant concept. I thought it's a fascinating take on uh, disruptive technologies and certainly a great uh, visual conversation starter. So I encourage you to take this back to your respective countries and talk about it. But it's important at the same time to recognize that actually each of these disruptive technologies don't work alone. It is the coming together of these technologies that are creating the waves of disruption that's transforming organizations. And one wave, which I like to characterize as a digital wave, is particularly different from the rest. I think advances in the field of robotics, in the internet of things and artificial intelligence, as well as its amplification when they interact with each other, can create a sort of impact that are both unprecedented in breadth as in scale. And uh, as morning uh, panelists have said, I think it is comparable to the introduction of a commercial electric power in the 20th century. And just like electric power, we think this digital wave will be the fuel that will transform business practices in nearly every sector, whether it's B2B, B2C, and even governments. And companies, as we know from this morning, are already exploiting AI to reinvent themselves. And it is not just the technology companies, but the non-technology companies that are doing that. And so let me share with you three quick examples from our part of the world. For example, a Chinese motorists in a car accident can now use an app to take picture of the damaged car. The AI will then cross-reference it with millions of photos in its database to recognize the extent of damage and instantaneously indicate the insurance payout. And in most cases, the insurance company can reimburse the money into the motorist's account even before the car gets towed away, because that's Chinese roads, right? In Singapore, um, AI is helping bank recruiters to deal with 7,000 candidates vying for 20 roles. So it is called JIM, uh, which stands for Jobs Intelligence Maestro. So this AI recruiter will review the resume, collect the applicant's responses for pre-screening questions, and conduct psychometric profiling assessments on candidates. There's also now an AI doctor in China that provides a smart diagnosis plan that's based on big medical treatment plan of millions of records for the doctor's reference. And using smart voice, semantics, and AI, it increases the efficiency of the doctor's consultation by more than five times. And again, with AI, the company is able to more accurately and uh, more speedily interpret CT scans to detect lung-related issues, uh, allowing early treatment that saves lives. So there's this saying, right, that if the rate of change is faster outside than the rate of change inside, then the end is inside. So if companies are so aggressively applying AI, what are we doing in the government? At least in Singapore case, we believe AI is a strategic capability that we need to build up to improve the outcomes for our citizens. And to build up this capability will require us to do three things. One, organizing the data right. Two, creating the right value for citizens. And third, earning public trust that AI is being applied ethically, rigorously, and with careful consideration of the interests. In other words, applying AI for the people rather than AI to the people. AI cannot be done without good data. Governments have a lot of data, but very often it is in silo, it's disorganized, or at best, not rich enough to derive the kind of insights AI can harness. So in Singapore, we are organizing our data around the data life cycle with a goal of reducing the time taken to apply data to projects from 18 months to less than 30 days for most cases. And our new data architecture will allow us to reduce the duplication and increase the efficiency for seamless data sharing across government. This is supported by enabling policies 
legislation and a heavy focus on capability building to build the foundation for us to harness AI for government. With the data organized, we are starting to deploy AI to create real value for our citizens in three areas. One, to improve policy outcomes. Two, to deliver better services. And three, to enhance our operational effectiveness. For example, we are now using the travel fare card data as well as mobile data information to better plan public transport routes. To improve service delivery, we have similarly deployed Ask Jamie, which is a chatbot on government websites that answers the most frequently asked questions. And our municipalities are applying AI onto the big data for predictive maintenance and to optimize municipal services. Delivering the real value to citizens help build trust and legitimacy. We are developing an AI ethics and governance framework for the public sector so that decisions made are transparent, explainable and fair and can stand up to scrutiny. And this approach has helped us maintain the trust of the public in leveraging AI technologies for public good. So we need to be bold in embracing AI and transforming government in meaningful ways. I think we should perhaps see AI not as artificial intelligence, but as IA, uh, intelligent augmentation. We believe the application of AI will help make government services more conversational, uh, more location aware, where anything can be delivered as a service. Uh, in other words, more intelligent. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you, Peng Son. Also, Zetterberg, the floor is yours. Thank you. So, here is a sooner picture of my daughter, I would say. I think, at least. She's coming up here. It's Hedda. She's nine years old. At, and she is, of course, my future. And it's also a reminder for us all that the future is already here. A reminder of our future citizens and consumers and their expectations and needs. So we all know it's really complex to drive digital change, digital transformation in the government sector and in public services. But we know also it's possible, it's needed, and we will make it together. And we need to do it in a sustainable way, and we need to do what is expected from us. And in this major time of change, I think it's really important to balance all both opportunities with innovations that we can't reject. We need to use that for the best and for the public good. But we also need to balance with the risk around integrity, ethics, and digital security, of course. And uh, we can say that trust is the driver of development, the driver of innovation. As, as long as we make this balance act good enough, we can go forward. forward. Although AI is already here, the practical impact of AI and the scaling of AI has been quite limited in large parts of our government and public sector in Sweden and also in many other countries, I believe. So we need to put AI to work now. We need to test more, we need to experiment, we need to share all our good examples as we do here because we need to talk it more in specific terms so we can show how we could improve quality and efficiency in welfare, health, in learning, sustainability and services. And by that, we can just demystify the AI and we can encourage more people to contribute, to help us to be critical, constructive and creative. So in Sweden, we have some prom promising examples from the public sector. And in the city of Stockholm, uh, they are using a new AI-based screening method for early detection of kids' reading and writing difficulties. And it's resulting in a much earlier support to children in need, and the screening takes about two minutes per student. At Karolinska University, uh, hospital, they use AI for breast cancer screening. With the help of AI, fewer women will die in breast cancer when their tumor is detected earlier. And also in the municipality of Trelleborg, the authorities are using algorithms to handle decisions for social support. And the time for pro processing the decisions have now, with automation, been reduced from 10 days to one day. And to support applied AI, Sweden has launched a data factory arena in Lindholm and Science Park in Gothenburg. Joint efforts among public and private and academia. And you can all take part of that and be uh, discussed with them. They're also here in Tallinn today. So although we can see all the many benefits of, with AI, we have some challenges. And it shouldn't be underestimated, under of course. 
and some of them is around the skills deficits among citizens, consumers, leaders, employees, civil servants, researchers, businesses, and so on. And we need to empower both people with digital skills and interests and mobilize around on a broad basis. So on a conference like this, we need not only the great AI experts to eat the sector, the businesses, we need a good representatives from healthcare, school, industry, and transport to tell us why are we doing this, what is the purpose, how can we make good effects and create value in new ways. And we also need to strengthen the leadership. The leadership that have the possibility to encourage us to be innovative, to try, test, and a new mindset. It's a no, new kind of log logic, how you use data and transform the government with new kind of services in a new way, in an ecosystem, together with other partners. We also we need to be much more adaptable uh, to adapt the public operations and policy system. We can do that with uh, the policy labs and we can also need some more lawyers with good knowledge in technology to help us to find out how can we protect the good values that we need, but also find innovation um, that makes value for people and for good. And as you know, the data is the great capital of our time, it's the strategic resource and the real good power. So we need to make more use of that. We need to improve the data access and the possibilities of combine, combining different data. The Sweden government just launched a national approach on AI this spring with a goal that Sweden shall be leading in taking advantage of the opportunities from using AI with the aim of strengthening Swedish welfare and Swedish competitiveness. And four important areas that we're working on is education, research, innovation and use, and framework and infrastructure. And we are committed to do this. We need to put AI to work in the government and for the public good. But we also know that if we, we will succeed in this, we need close collaboration, public, private, academia, civil organization, and on a global level. And we need to keep up the good dialogue with people, empower them. And uh, since it's running quite fast with the technological development, we need to act now so we can benefit humanity and also to make a good world for the coming generations. Thank you very much, uh, Osa. Uh, with a particular pleasure, uh, I'd like to ask Martin Kaivat uh, from the home team, uh, Estonia, to take the floor. So, uh, first, thank you all for being here, because uh, taking your time and coming to this discussion uh, on AI, because I think this is the technology knows no borders, so we have to work together on this. Uh, and as mentioned uh, on all of the previous talks, uh, there is lots of good ideas on the table, and uh, we also in Estonia feel that AI is a, a bit of fresh air uh, that uh, will disrupt also us and the governments in order to understand that uh, this change is necessary. Uh, but let's face it, uh, we're all inventing the bicycle here. It's a, such a new topic, there is lots of different options uh, and there are no clear answers yet. Um, in Estonia, we're on the, also inventing the bicycle. Uh, we have a special strategy unit uh, working on it. Uh, uh, some ideas, some hunches, uh, some concepts. And all of us probably get it that uh, uh, AI will change government for good. But what, what I would like to share in this short uh, note uh, was that uh, the fundamental information architecture in Estonia has been distributed since 2001. We have a very strong digital identity. This is a key to our ecosystem. With the coming of AI and all sorts of other new applications, uh, we, we actually see that uh, we can uh, also fundamentally change this architecture, how either governmental services or, or uh, different um, interactions are made. Uh, currently, in a dis distributed system, uh, there are lots of dependencies from different databases and systems. Uh, the aim is to remove the dependencies, so we will have an uh, autonomous agent-based society, whether these are algorithms or humans or however. 
But in a slogan -like, like way of saying it, uh, in Estonia, we, uh, the, the Prime Minister mentioned, we have a mythological character called the Krait. This is our synonym for, for uh, AI. Uh, that want, we want to do is build, build a personal bureaucrat uh, for each citizen. Uh, AI-based assistant to help along with all of the governmental jobs and assisting uh, him or her in, in her life's choices. And, uh, if, if making it maybe more bit uh, bureaucratic, then uh, this would be the de facto implementation of the API first government. The idea where when you make a governmental service, then you have to define the, the connectivity before you even start redesigning it. Um, another way of saying it is uh, interoperability by default. The idea is that all uh, services and databases should be able to connect. And also the very fundamental uh, thing is that in Estonia, all citizens are the owners of their own information. So that the citizens would always actually be in control of what kind of data they give out, how it, this is used, and there will be always um, auditability in this. Uh, we see great potential in all of the buzzwords uh, like AI and uh, blockchain, for example, but uh, bringing them home into a very rational scheme is actually not that easy. Uh, we can make a lot of gadgetry, uh, but this does not fundamentally change the core processes. Core processes are like tied up in legacy, legal systems, laws, and mainly mindset and culture. So we have to emphasize the idea that uh, people should be more open. We should have a more open discussion also in the public. And, and uh, only then we can provide the service quality change that uh, this technology promises. There is lots of ideas, but uh, I think we can actually change the fundamental architecture how societies work with the use of this technology. Thank you. Thank you very much. And I love the idea of the bureaucrat. Uh, that might stick. Uh, last, but uh, certainly not least, uh, Dr. Vzilev. Yeah. Good afternoon. Uh, Includ inclusiveness was among the keywords uh, we heard a lot today, and we may think that uh, in this digital world, there are no borders for free flow of information and e-services, but still there are invisible borders remaining. And uh, let's take language. Uh, people cannot access information or use even, use even the best e-service if it's not in the language what we fully understand. And uh, it's particularly important for uh, smaller language communities and smaller countries. Like, let's take uh, my uh, mother tongue, Latvian. We, uh, in Latvia, uh, Latvian language is spoken by about two million people only. And uh, of course, uh, government services are provided in uh, Latvian language. But we want to make these services accessible and used by uh, many other people who uh, do cross-border business and social and cultural exchange. So how to provide these e-services uh, and information across language borders? Because human translation is, is too slow and too expensive. And, uh, as we heard this morning as well, then uh, one of the areas where AI is making the best progress is uh, machine translation and uh, understanding of human speech. And AI technologies can serve governments to make their services uh, accessible across language borders. And in, in Latvia, our country integrates AI technologies in its national e-government ecosystem to make e-services multilingual, accessible, also with voice, with spoken language interaction, and enriched with virtual assistants. And it's interesting to see that virtual assistants are hot topics in government uh, developments in, in Finland, in Singapore, in Estonia, and in Latvia as well. So we see a great potential in this area. 
And uh, this multilingual e infrastructure in Latvia includes uh, world leading machine translation, speech technologies that open public services to multilingual speakers, to country visitors, foreign investors, cooperation partners, and also facilitates e service usage for people with special needs, like visually impaired people. And this smart virtual assistant uh, was first employed by a business register in Latvia, and then people just like to use it to get information about how to start a business or, or manage it. And uh, uh, we, there, there are also different other examples of AI application, uh, like machine translation. Uh, AI based special specialized machine translation system uh, was, sh is, was showing its benefits for the presidency of European Council. It enabled uh, European uh, presidency staff and thousands of visitors to deal with huge volumes of multilingual information. When it was first launched here in Tallinn uh, a year ago at the first digital summit, and now it's, it's and after that it served presidency in Bulgaria and now serves the presidency in Austria. So these are just few examples how AI technologies like machine translation and uh, chatbots can provide efficient solutions to for truly inclusive multilingual e-government services. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you very much uh, to all the experts for your inputs. I'd now love to open the floor uh, for a discussion. I'd like to ask Minister Breen to start us off. Yeah, thank you very much indeed, Danny. And, again, and I want to thank all the experts um, from all over the, the world, the global number of experts we have here. Uh, given their, um, you know, their, their expertise to us at, at this very important digital conference. I suppose uh, you know, we all talk about government. Governments must lead in this. I think that's extremely important. And only last week, um, I was in Switzerland with 30 high-tech Irish companies uh, on a trade mission, but it was a trade mission with a difference. It was a trade mission on the, fu on the future of work. And we brought uh, 30 companies from three different sectors, from the medtech sector, agri-tech sector, and the construction sector. And we looked at how uh, the future of work will be in these sectors. We talked uh, to, uh, we went to the Future Farm in, in Switzerland, where Ireland and, our, uh, and, the, and the Swiss agencies are now working collaboratively together in this. We looked how, uh, at how artificial intelligence can um, save money for farmers in relation to the use of that in, in, in many areas. We looked at the construction sector, how um, robotics and AI, again, can be used in the construction sector and is being used in the construction sector, again, uh, how, um, you know, how it will transform that sector. And also, we looked at the medtech sector, and uh, we visited a number of, of diagnostic companies. Obviously, data is extremely important here, artificial intelligence. It's the future, particularly uh, you know, when you look at what an Apple Watch can do at the moment in relation to ECGs, heart rates, so on, so etc. So this is very much part of what the uh, medtech companies are doing now at the moment, um, ensuring that they have data and um, that, that, that um, you know, they have that data and it can be of huge benefit uh, using artificial intelligence keep people out of our hospitals, keep people in their homes, so so, so. so that's one area where our government is working really hard with the, uh, the private sector. Uh, the other area I think, uh, you know, we talked about there, I think, uh, I think was Eva talked about our, um, artificial intelligence, that it's not the future. Of course it's not the future, but I think we're not there yet. And I think we have obligations to ensure, um, you know, that to, to inform people of what, uh, because the word trust has been used. Yes, trust is really important here. I suppose from our point of view, um, you know, it's, it's when you're a government and you're trying to uh, promote artificial intelligence and the whole digital revolution, it is difficult, particularly for some of the ageing population that you have, you have out there. We're lucky enough in Ireland, we have a young population, 50% of our population is, is, is under 25, and 50% uh, of them uh, also uh, of the age gap between 25 and 33 have a third level degree. So they will grow up with the whole digital revolution and they will adopt very quickly to um, our artificial intelligence, rob robotic, robotics, uh, virtual reality, all, th all those areas. Um, and so uh, it's important uh, that we have trust. We're looking enough, as I said, in a recent survey in Ireland, um, people do trust Ireland. But it is hard to, 
um, get your message out there. And what we need to do as a government, I think, is first of all, avoid a digital divide. I think that's, that's really important out there. Uh, and uh, to, know, to ensure that we uh, inform the people of the benefits of artificial intelligence, the benefits, the good benefits. We spoke in the earlier session of what the bad benefits can be of artificial intelligence, but it's in part that's what governments must do here. Education is going to play a very key role in this as well, uh, and we need to help um, every citizen to at least have the basic digital competence uh, in art, uh, out there in the digital revolution. Uh, um, uh, you know, and the other area, I suppose, is that we should use artificial intelligence to help uh, people that have visual issues and, and learning benefits. And that, again, leads by example. Um, it's, you know, and, and, and to inform people as well that artificial intelligence will not replace jobs. It will replace low-end jobs, but it will replace them with higher-end jobs. And that's, again, where education and the third-level institutions come into place. Presently in Ireland, uh, we're collaborating, we're working very closely with the uh, uh, private sector, we're working with the third level institutions in government to ensure that we can uh, embrace, ensure that everybody embraces the technical revolution that's out there at the moment. Our universities are doing master degrees now uh, for engineers with, uh, for third level, uh, for, with, for master degrees in, third, in artificial intelligence for engineers out there. So it's constant work. It is challenging, it is difficult, um, there's also the resource issue as well, but I think it's by collaborating, uh, by working together, and that's where the EU single digital market very much comes into place, um, and I hope that we can make more progress on that uh, in the future. So that's just a few thoughts, Danny, in relation to how we're dealing with it. Uh, we want to try and to be like Estonia, maybe the best in the class in this. We're getting there. Uh, we have uh, many multinational companies that are helping us out in this as well, and particularly the SME sector, which I think often find it difficult uh, to uh, embrace that sector because of resource issues. Thank you very much, uh, indeed. Uh, I'd like to give the floor to Dr. Krings. Yeah, thank you very much. I'm still pondering about the personal bureaucrat that everybody should, should get. In Germany, at least, people say we have too many bureaucrats, but uh, I understand that this is a different concept, not uh, more people on the payroll, but, but helping you. But I think that's, I think the approach co completely right. In, in, the, in this digital age, what do people want? So it should be the first question for a democratically elected government, for any government, actually. Um, and I think, they, I think artificial intelligence is certainly not the first thing that comes to, to people's mind. Maybe they, um, it would be useful for them, but they, they probably don't think about the means, but about the end, about how they should want to be treated, how they, how, how they want to go about um, getting government services. So one of the main issues now for Germany is not even for our government, not even the question of artificial uh, intelligence, even we do uh, a, a have a policy paper on this uh, and, and, and working, working on it. Um, I think the main issue also in terms of, of the, the greatness of the project, the, uh, the width of the project, is to have uh, digital access. So we have now a law that says um, everybody should have digital access to the 575 major government services provided on a federal, state and, and local level. And I can tell you that in the federal state it's even more complicated than in, in governments which are maybe more like a monolithic uh, system. Uh, and the main problem is that I think 80% around of these services are not provided by the federal government, so we have to bring uh, the state governments and the local governments on board. Uh, we want to do this in five years' time. And I think that's a very major thing to get, make it easier for people to communicate with government to get services without showing up at the local town hall or at the local um, um, uh, government uh, entity uh, at, at, their, at their offices. And um, of course, if we use more um, more, uh, or get more access through digital um, services. I think the question of artificial intelligence, what it can also bring in terms of providing services, um, gets more clear maybe also to people in the next step. And of course, we also have to, to see that, um, as we mentioned, artificial intelligence can cause also new kind of political or ethical problems. That's why we set up a data ethics uh, commission now, which has been actually set up a few months ago. Um, we have all kinds of new, new problems. One of them, maybe the most vital one, or one, one, one quite um, gross example, is, uh, is the artificially or self-driving car, you know, and now they, it's in a different, a difficult situation and the only chance to get out is either um, going over a, a young person or an old person. So what, what should be in, implemented in this algorithm, you know? Uh, do we save the young people? Do we, <laughs> do we save the, el the older ones? So that's maybe a, a quite um, a strong uh, problem, but we have all kinds of, of smaller 
ethical problems that uh, we have to think address as, as a government to make the rules um, that are also applicable also for private uh, private services there. And um, that means the public must be able to understand how administrative decisions, uh, but also maybe in, in the private sector, are made and must have also effective legal remedies when AI, AI is used. I think transparency is key, the ability to review data processing, protection of data and fundamental rights, and freedom from discrimination. Also important is that public administration staff must be thoroughly trained to deal with artificial intelligence and attention should be paid also to the security policy aspects here. And maybe let me make one last remark. And I think it was a wonderful idea um, to start this uh, conference um, with the voice of a, of a child. Um, because people are certainly afraid of things they can't understand. And I don't think that any short-term government program can make people understand artificial intelligence, probably can't even uh, make me understand artificial <laughs> intelligence in all these aspects. But I think we have to try to train and educate a new generation of AI literate young people. They won't be able to understand all kinds of algorithms, but the idea how these things work in general, uh, why they can be helpful, why they can be a danger at times, I think this has to be built in also in what we teach in, in schools, what we teach our young people um, to have a very grown up and responsible uh, approach um, to this phenomenon which will um, have a great impact on all of our lives, lives in the next decades. Thank you very much, uh, indeed. Is there anyone else who would like to uh, make a comment or ask a question at this point? If not, I'd love to uh, open it to the floor. But before we do that, uh, we'll go to uh, DG Karilainen. Yeah, I just wanted to also add on that uh, in Finland, we, are, we have been producing now a report, the um, AI for uh, the ethical information management in the times of the AI. And um, that is under the consultation now and we will be bringing it to the um, government uh, by the end of this year, really to get the whole government talking about what are the, the possibilities of AI and uh, that the information is, is the uh, key and glue there. Then we are also uh, implementing, um, um, taking to government as well, uh, to the parliament, the uh, new information management law, which should enable what, what you were telling the API first, but data to flow, one sole principle, and, and the uh, transparency and interoperability. And with the law, it's, it's much easier to take it forward once we get it for hopefully finalized. Thank you. Please go ahead. I just w wanted to make a couple of points because there's so many good points to be made and I agree with um, my two fellow ministers and, and virtually everything they've said. One very basic thing before we start talking about um, AI and emerging technologies is we have to make sure that everyone's connected. Uh, as a presupposition now, in Aus Estonia you're uh, probably more advanced than some countries. Uh, it's very important that we, we don't forget that and we, we think about making sure that everyone uh, in rural areas and old and young are not only connected, but that they actually access and use these things. So that brings us to education and skills, which uh, I think we've talked about before. Um, I do agree uh, that it has got tremendous uh, potential for good uh, for government and elsewhere, but that is not guaranteed. So we have to be very careful to protect the interests of citizens, including uh, privacy uh, and, and areas like that, and to make sure that there, are, there is regulation, but not too much regulation, to protect against bias. So, for example, it affects very basic things like uh, whether you get a mortgage or not. Um, and these have to be mentioned. So we have to develop, uh, as um, Pat said, about we have to develop trust, and I think that's a theme that's come out in, in the last um, session I was at. Uh, and we are uh, developing that. We also have a, a data ethics body that we're setting up. Uh, we call it data ethics and innovation because trying to get the balance right is very important. Um, and of course, uh, and data protection regulation, we're, we're, on, a, uh, we're on the EU basis uh, at the moment. 
and, and we intend to stay that way, I should hasten to add. What, what is uh, very important and comes out is that the importance of international cooperation on this. And so uh, organizations, um, World Economic Forum, the UN, and, and things that everyone belongs to, um, it's very important that we work with them and, and we will do that. Uh, and uh, that's why um, di like-minded digital nations uh, such as are present here, it's important that we continue to do what we're doing today. Uh, I'd like to make some comments. Um, I'll make some general comments because in, in the normal course of work, we normally have to deal with a lot of details about technical stuff to get things done, all the hows of implementation. But a forum like that allows one to sort of take a step back sometimes to think about the bigger issues. So there, there have been so many issues that have been raised, but I'd like to address uh, in particular the issue of trust as well as uh, whether technology has borders or not. I think those were two very interesting things. Um, about trust in AI, in a way, I was a bit surprised at how narrow the discussion has been that it is about trust in AI, because I, I think trust is more general than just as it pertains to whether it's AI or not. Uh, I, I think it's how the public views the government as a whole, and it's not about any specific slice of what the government does. Um, and in this sense, um, even in a country like Singapore where generally the public trust in the government is very high. Um, there is a lot of hesitation and uncertainty about the application of technology generally, and I guess particularly about digital and AI technologies. And why is that so is something that we've been sort of grappling with. Um, and I think coming to Lord Ashton's point, I mean, one of the key things would have to do with whether the public feels that you generally have their welfare at heart. I mean, it's not how much you can do or how well you can do, it's whether what you are doing is in their interest or not. And is that an instinctive uh, feel that they, they, they trust that you have their welfare at heart? And that's something that we try to convey a lot, um, and I think we have some way to go. So this issue of trust, to me, it's, it's something more general than just in AI. It, it's got to do much more widely with how government as a whole is trusted or not. And then coming to uh, Miguel's point of why there seems to be that paradox about uh, some of the more technological advanced countries uh, where the public does not trust the technology, maybe because the public understands the technology better. And that's why they, they, they trust it less. And they, they know that actually the government can use it for good or for bad uh, much more deeply than maybe the other publics do. And that, that's why maybe that, there's that paradox. Uh, so we, we are in Singapore trying to work hard on how to um, explain to the public uh, um, the technologies. On the issue of technology, uh, whether it's with borders or not, Personally, I'm not as uh, sanguine as uh, some, sometimes the very cliché thing that technology does not have borders. I think technology may, may not have borders when it comes to its consequences and its effects, but technology definitely has its borders in the sense of who holds the expertise, who has better expertise in it. Um, and not all technologies are open source. Uh, so in a forum like this, uh, obviously, the, if you take a step back, the interesting thing is that the two biggest AI powers are not here. The US and the Chinese are not here. Um, and you read many articles of how in, in both countries, uh, not just AI, but I guess, I guess caught up in the whole general relationship is that there's much more than meets the eye in their trade war and it's about strategic competition of which Obviously, digital capabilities and AI capabilities are, uh, is an integral core to it. And as we said earlier, and when we ask the audience whether we believe this is a, a next industrial revolution, if most of us believe that it's a next industrial revolution, you look at what happened in the previous industrial revolutions. The very last industrial revolution uh, of the 1870s to the 1890s of the internal combustion engine, the telegraph and all that, what happened? What happened was it led to Europeans colonizing the world. And if this is an industrial revolution, do you expect 
consequences that are less than that, uh, I think uh, I'm not as optimistic about just taking it for granted. I think it's something that, you, that has to be worked on. Uh, there has to be uh, international discussions, possibly international norms about some of uh, how these technologies can be used, how much visibility there, there should be, how much accountability there should be with regard to some of these technology. So uh, I'll just leave it in general like that. Thank you very much indeed. We are sadly uh, at the end of our time. Uh, we started with the organ printing, uh, which I did not expect uh, to hear in this session. Um, but I think we heard many very specific and tangible uh, use cases that already exist today and can deliver a huge amount of value. Uh, but, uh, and this was said many times, uh, we need to get the basics right uh, first, possibly. Uh, we need to make sure that people have access to these technologies before maybe we start worrying too much about the organ printing. And there's a tremendous potential, uh, but we have to get this right and earn citizens' trust. And I thought the, the point that was made that maybe those that trust less uh, are better informed, uh, interesting and intriguing and certainly something to reflect on. And to build that trust and legitimacy, we need to uh, build this technology for and possibly with people rather than do it to people. With that, uh, I'd like to thank you uh, very much. Uh, this has been a great uh, roundtable. Uh, we'll be here for the rest of the summit, and I hope we can continue this conversation in the minutes, hours, days, months, and years to come. Thank you very much. <laughs>